This is a temple to the goddess Isis, one of the most famous Egyptian goddesses, wife of the god king Osiris, mother to the falcon god Horus. So where in Egypt would you find this temple to this Egyptian goddess? Well, not in Egypt. This is the temple of Isis in Pompeii, the Roman city famously destroyed by the volcano Vesuvius in 79 CE. But hold on, what is an Egyptian goddess doing in a Roman city on the Italian peninsula? The answer is a fascinating example of religious exchange and evolution. Isis captured the attention of the Greeks and the Romans, and worship of this goddess expanded outside of Egypt, evolving into what historians call a Greco-Roman mystery religion. Today's video is a collaboration with my friend and colleague Dr. Angela Puka. She's an expert in the study of magic, esotericism, and contemporary paganism. She publishes videos like Historical Misconceptions in Paganism, and Sleep Paralysis and Spiritual Experiences. In other words, really cool stuff. And all of her videos are rooted in the same critical academic approach that I use here on Religion for Breakfast. My video will examine Isis devotion in the Roman Empire, and she'll be exploring Isis devotion in the here and now, the modern period. So click the link in the comments below to watch her companion video. The ancient Egyptians worshipped Isis as far back as the 3rd millennium BCE. She's mentioned as the Great Isis in the so-called pyramid texts. And she's probably best known as the wife and sister of the god Osiris. You may have heard the story of her recovering Osiris' body parts and reviving him after he was killed and dismembered by his brother Seth. From stories like this, Isis came to be associated with magic and healing, along with motherhood as the mother of the falcon god Horus. Since every pharaoh was the incarnation of Horus, technically every pharaoh was thus the son of Isis. In a bunch of different artistic representations, she's portrayed in this maternal role, with Horus the child sitting in her lap, or the famous motif Isis Lactans, the goddess breastfeeding Horus. Because of its striking similarities to Maria Lactans, the Mother Mary nursing Jesus, scholars debate to this day to what extent Egyptian iconography inspired this later artistic motif. Over time, she grew more and more popular in the Egyptian pantheon, becoming one of the most popular gods in the Egyptian late period. For example, check out the huge Philae temple on an island near the city of Aswan in Upper Egypt. This was a gigantic temple complex built and dedicated to the goddess Isis, first built during the late period but then was expanded under the Ptolemies, one of the Hellenistic kingdoms that succeeded Alexander the Great. This skyrocketing popularity coincided with the cult of Isis hopping the Mediterranean Sea over to Greece and Rome where, as we mentioned, it eventually developed into what historians call a Greco-Roman mystery religion, sometimes simply called mysteries or a mystery cult. Now, I'm using that word cult in a technical scholarly sense of the word. It refers to a system of veneration and devotion directed toward a particular figure or deity. We see this sense of the word cult in the word cultivation. So the cult of Isis is the worship and care of the goddess, rather than the more mainstream sense of the word which often implies a negative, extreme, or violent religious group. So what about the mystery part of mystery cult? These were religious groups in the ancient Greco-Roman world, characterized by a few features. Number one, voluntary association. Anyone could join. Two, initiation. If you wanted to join, you needed to undergo a series of rituals to become a member. In many cases, this involved purification rituals like abstaining from certain food, alcohol, or sex, as well as having some financial skin in the game. This could include paying for the goods needed to participate, like buying special ritual clothing or simply financially supporting the organization with dues. Three, mystery religions often involved secrecy. The teachings and many of the rituals were kept on a need-to-know basis among initiated members only, though historians debate how secret they really were, and many of the rituals were public or at least semi-public. After all, this temple to Isis in Pompeii is not exactly an easy-to-hide building. In fact, it's connected to the city's theater, and scholars have argued that they must have used the public theater for some of their rituals. Some mystery religions also involved rituals performed at night or ecstatic rituals, like dancing, music, or even the possible use of hallucinogenic substances, at least possibly in the case of the Eleusinian mysteries. The Greeks used words like orgia, mysteria, or teletai to describe these religions, usually translated as mystic rites, mysteries, or initiations. Some of the most well-known mysteries include the aforementioned Mysteries of Eleusis, the Mysteries of Samothrace, the Cult of the Goddess Magna Mater, the Cult of Mithras, and of course, the Cult of Isis. The worship of Isis was established in Greece as early as the 300s BCE. An inscription from Athens mentions Egyptians building a sanctuary for her there. And many priests early on were Egyptian immigrants. And in the following centuries, worship of Isis rapidly spread east into Asia Minor and west to Italy. Her temple in Pompeii was built by 80 BCE. And within a few decades, public worship of Isis was established in Rome. Now, as far as historians can tell, the worship of Isis outside of Egypt did not start as a mystery cult. She was often worshipped alongside the Greco-Egyptian god Serapis, 
like at the double temple of Isis and Serapis built in Rome in an area full of other major religious buildings like the Pantheon. In all likelihood, this temple functioned just like any other Roman temple, without the mystery or initiation aspects. But by the late Hellenistic period, the mysteries of Isis became a popular option. The scholar Jaime Alvar theorizes that initiation became an option as the cult expanded into the Eastern Mediterranean, where they would have encountered Greek initiation practices among the older, more prestigious mysteries, like the mysteries of Eleusis. So what did the mysteries of Isis look like? One of the richest sources of information is a Roman novel by the philosopher Apuleius, called the Metamorphoses. It's a surprisingly hilarious story about a guy named Lucius who, driven by curiosity about magic, accidentally gets transformed into a donkey. The story follows his misadventures as he desperately tries to return to human form. Finally, at the end of the story, Isis appears to Lucius to save him, and he's initiated into her mysteries. Throughout this chapter in the book, Apuleius vividly describes an initiation, but historians debate to what extent Apuleius is describing it accurately. It is a fictionalized account after all, and he was a satirist, so maybe he was unfairly mocking the cult, but many view the chapter as a generally trustworthy source for understanding her mysteries. From the Metamorphoses, we get a sense of how the Romans conceptualized Isis. In the story, she appears to Lucius in a dream, and declares herself the mother of the universe, the mistress of all the elements, the highest of the powers above, and the queen of the shades below, the manifestation of all the gods and goddesses. This is supreme god language, the sort of language you might see describing the big monotheistic gods of Christianity or Islam, all-knowing, all-powerful, the creator of the universe. Now, that's not a perfect analogy, but as the worship of Isis evolved outside of Egypt, she evolved into a cosmic and savior god. For example, consider this inscription from a temple of Isis at Cyrene, in modern-day Libya. I, Isis, am sole ruler of time. All name me supreme goddess, the greatest of all the gods in the heavens. Without me, nothing has come into existence, and the stars don't hold their courses without first receiving my instructions. So again, supreme goddess language. Nothing has come into existence without her. To quote the scholar Julia Gasparo, this is the Hellenistic face of Isis. She becomes the queen of the heavens. We also see this in how Isis is portrayed in artwork found at Pompeii. She's often portrayed in the guise of the Roman goddess Fortuna, the goddess of fate. Isis is shown holding a ship rudder and placing her foot on the globe, symbolically steering fate with sovereignty over the universe. We can think of this as a form of henotheism, devotion to a single supreme god without necessarily rejecting the existence of other gods. Along with this new cosmic dimension, Isis also evolved into a savior goddess. Returning again to the Metamorphoses, Isis says to Lucius, You will live in happiness, you will live in glory under my guardianship. And when you have completed your life span and travel down to the dead, there too you will find me, shining among the shades of Acheron. So she promises a beautiful afterlife to her devotees, but she goes on to say that she can even prolong his life if he obeys and worships her. So here we see a salvific aspect of Isis in the Roman Empire. This aspect started to emerge a few hundred years before in Egypt. Let's consider a series of hymns to Isis inscribed on a Hellenistic era sanctuary in the Fayum Oasis, located west of the Nile. One hymn reads, As many as are bound fast in prison in the power of death, all are saved if they pray that you may be present to help. Elsewhere, the same hymn calls her deathless savior. The scholar Jaime Alvar draws attention to the word present in that phrase, all are saved if they pray that you may be present to help. The hymn is asking for the literal presence of the goddess, and we saw this in the Metamorphoses when the goddess visited Lucius in a dream. Dream visitations apparently were a primary way that she communed with her devotees. So in the Metamorphoses, we catch a glimpse of how Isis was conceptualized as a cosmic and savior goddess, but we also see the public rituals that were performed for her in Roman cities. The goddess tells Lucius to attend a procession of her priests and eat a wreath of roses being carried by one of them, which will turn him back into a human. Remember, he's still a donkey at this point. Presumably, Apuleius is envisioning one of her public festivals, and we know of two of them. The Noigium Acides was a festival celebrated on March 5th, which involved a public procession through the city, down to the sea, or a nearby river, where they'd launch a model ship filled with a bunch of offerings. Here, Isis was worshipped as a patron goddess of navigation, sailors, and merchants, and basically anyone who needed to cross the seas. The other festival was the Inventio Osirides, held between October 28th and November 3rd. This festival celebrated the discovery of Osiris' body, as told in that famous myth of him being dismembered. And the festival even involved reenactments of this myth. So even though historians classify the cult of Isis as a mystery cult, that word mystery doesn't mean it was invisible to your average person in the Roman Empire. 
If you lived in Rome, Pompeii, or Corinth, you would have seen public parades for Isis marching through your streets at least a few times a year. Her priests and priestesses were easily recognizable, carrying statues of Isis or Osiris, wearing white linen robes, and shaking the Egyptian ritual rattle called a sistrum. And priests with heads so closely shaven that Apollaea says they reflected light. A fresco preserved in Herculaneum, another city destroyed alongside Pompeii, shows what a public ritual to Isis may have looked like. A priest stands in the center, presumably holding a golden jar filled with sacred Nile water, bringing it out from the temple. Priests with shaven heads stand around, with one fanning a fire on an altar. On either side of the priest are two groups of people, presumably followers of Isis, possibly simply witnessing the ritual or participating as choirs. Some scholars think that this is a depiction of a procession that would have gone forth into the city. The Mysteries of Isis also drew unwanted attention, and gained a bad reputation from some corners of so-called polite Roman society. In 59 BCE, the Roman Senate banned the worship of Isis alongside some other Egyptian gods, but eventually had to back down because of public outcry. Other critics attacked the women who worshipped Isis. For example, the Roman poet Juvenal calls her a brothel keeper, and accuses the women who follow Isis as mindless. The historian Josephus implies that the religion's nighttime rituals were sexually obscene, which is ironic because all of our other sources actually stress the sexual celibacy of her devotees. So these attacks probably stem from a prejudice against what they viewed as a foreign or new religion. So if they weren't having a bunch of sex, what was going on with the more exclusive aspects of the cult of Isis? Well, we don't really know. Initiation into the mysteries was a secretive process, and it was widely believed that it was dangerous to uncover these mysteries if you weren't a member yourself. The Greek geographer Pausanias records two dramatic stories of men trying to sneak into temples of Isis to try to see what's inside. One guy said that he saw the dead, and then later dropped dead himself. So we don't really know the exact details, but we can try to get a hint. According to Apuleius, initiation was a multi-day process. First, the high priest leads the main character Lucius into the sanctuary, and a book of hieroglyphs is brought out to read to him. He's sprinkled with water and then bathed before being brought back into the temple, and it stood before the image of the goddess. Lucius says, there the priest gave me in secret certain instructions, too holy for utterance. Whatever was said, he then needs to undergo a period of purification. He fasts for 10 days and spends a considerable amount of money on things he needs for the initiation. Finally, when the day arrives, he's dressed in a linen robe and led into the inner sanctum of the temple, where he does something. Lucius says, I would tell you if I were allowed to tell. Although he's not allowed to tell the secrets of the initiation, he confides that during it, he visits the underworld, the heavens, and directly approaches the gods. I approach the gods below and the gods above face to face and worship them from nearby. Over the years, historians have noticed the striking personal nature of Lucius's connection with Isis. She personally communicates with him in dreams. She declares that his whole life will belong to her if he's initiated. While I was reading this chapter, it reminded me about how evangelical Christians often describe their religious lives as personal relationships with Jesus Christ. In other words, theirs is a form of experiential devotion to a particular deity, characterized by deep emotional engagement and cultivating cognitive processes that interpret personal thoughts and experiences as direct communication with God. In other words, God can talk back to you, to use a phrase from the anthropologist Tanya Lerman. So can we characterize an initiation into the mysteries of Isis as having a personal relationship with her? In his book, Conversion, the historian of religion Arthur Darby Nock argued that conversion was a reorientation of the soul, a profound and intentional shift within an individual's inner life. It's not just about you changing your religious affiliation or adopting new rituals, it's a deep transformation in the core of your being, realizing that the old was wrong and the new is right. He argued that before that, Greeks and Romans only showed adhesion to particular gods or religious communities, a more casual affiliation without a profound internal change. Hence, you could be a devotee to several different gods. He argued that Christianity thus introduced a unique dynamic into the religious landscape, allowing for a more deeply personal religious transformation. He actually devotes an entire chapter to the cult of Isis, calling it the conversion of Lucius. But even though he admits that Apuleius describes some sort of emotional, profound conversion, Nock dismisses it as exceptional. It cannot be supposed that this is a normal level of pagan religious emotion. Mystery religions don't count as conversions as far as he's concerned because they did not involve the taking of a new way of life in place of the old. 
scholars over the years have heavily criticized Nock for creating a definition of conversion so narrow that only Protestant Christianity counts. He was tacitly arguing that Christianity was unique, special, and totally unlike anything else in the ancient world. Some critics have been quite harsh, saying that Nock's book is theology masquerading as critical religious studies. For example, one scholar calls his theory a methodologically lazy attempt to explain how Christianity triumphed. So many historians have pushed back against Nock, arguing that joining the mysteries of Isis likely did count as a deeply transformative conversion, insofar as initiates entered a new religious community, changed their religious identity, expressed a deep attachment to the goddess, and followed her orders and desires, often conveyed in dreams. We know from inscriptions that have been excavated that devotees describe themselves as consecrated to Isis. Others show that initiates actually adopted Isis as a new name, taking on a literal new identity. An ancient Greek gravestone records a dramatic inscription describing the life of an Isis initiate named Dionysia. For when she was 15 years old, Almighty Isis made her a servant and furnished her with the Isaic dress. Then after her servant reached 60 years, it was in a most hallowed way that she made her ready for death. The gravestone describes Isis calling her to a lifetime of service and devotion, and promised that she died a good death and went on to a good afterlife. Scholars like Birgit Bogue have argued that evidence like this shows that at least some initiates into the mysteries of Isis reoriented their entire life and identity around this goddess, and thus Christianity wasn't unique in antiquity in fostering a profound, life-altering identity that revolved around a particular divine figure. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you'd like to watch Angela's companion video, head on over to Angela's Symposium. The link is in the comments below. So while it's still January, I wanted to share a few thoughts as we ring in 2024. So I don't know if you've noticed, but over the past few weeks, a lot of YouTubers have been quitting YouTube. Uh, so Matt Pat over at Game Theory is quitting, Tom Scott over at Tom Scott, who's a legend in the educational YouTube landscape, is taking a step back from his channel. And a lot of people viewed this as you know, signaling a dark tide rising, that the YouTube career is impossible, that YouTube is collapsing, that, uh, I don't know, like, the, the YouTube is chewing up its creators and spitting them out. I don't think it's that dour, but one thing I do agree with Tom and Matt as I was watching their video is that YouTubing, it's, it's a hamster wheel. I think that's the perfect analogy. You publish a video, and then because you're incentivized to keep the momentum of the channel going, you have to immediately turn to making the next video. So it, it was interesting watching Matt and Tom's respective goodbye videos because on one hand, I totally get it. The, the YouTube hamster wheel is exhausting and I don't fault anyone who wants to jump off of it. But on the other hand, I couldn't 100% empathize because I feel like I'm nowhere near quitting. Like, I feel this intense drive to double down on religion for breakfast. And I've been doing this for uh, over eight years at this point. And as the channel has grown, I've gotten more and more concerned about misinformation, and I've gotten more and more concerned about making mistakes. It was reaching a point where I felt paralyzed to publish anything. Actually, it was I was feeling a great deal of anxiety before pushing that publish button. So over the years, I've increasingly hired expert help as writers and as fact checkers on my videos. So for example, much of the Taoism series on Religion for Breakfast is written by Dr. Jennifer Bushio. She's a scholar of Taoism, and she's amazing. So shout out to Dr. Bushio. And that's because I don't know about Taoism. I'm a scholar of ancient Roman religion. So when I'm writing about something I don't know a lot about, I want to bring in that expert help to fact check. And I'm able to do this in large part because of our 600 or so patrons on Patreon. Now, Patreon has changed a lot over time. Their logo has gotten worse and worse over time. Like, seriously, what is this? Uh, people have complained that Patreon has drifted from their core mission and their core product. And for the most part, I agree with a lot of those criticisms. Like, Patreon, you're a you're a payment processing middleman. Like, let's let's not reinvent the wheel here. But where I stand here in 2024 as an independent YouTuber, Patreon is not obsolete. In fact, it is one of the most important factors for the long-term success of Religion for Breakfast. And a huge factor here is that I'm on Patreon's founder plan. So sometime in 2019, Patreon raised their fees on any new creator joining their platform. But for the OG users like myself, I've been using Patreon since 2014 or 2015, we were grandfathered in on their lower rate, which is a 5% cut. So this means that every dollar you pledge on Patreon to Religion for Breakfast, we get 95% of that pledge. Just as a comparison, YouTube memberships takes a 30% cut. Seriously, YouTube, I am never, I'm going to never recommend memberships on my channel until you lower that fee. 5% versus 30%. 
That math is not hard for an independent YouTuber, and I'm very bad at math. So I'm trying to make 2024 a banner year for Religion for Breakfast. I want to diversify the topics I offer on this channel, which means bringing in more experts to help. I want to make more ambitious videos, which means bringing in editors and animators. And if you want to be part of that banner year, if you feel like I provide value on this channel, please support us on Patreon if you're able, only if you're able. I offer a 15% discount to anyone who signs up for an annual Patreon pledge. Annual pledges are great because it helps me plan ahead. So like I said, it gives me that revenue floor for 12 months. I don't have to worry about it. And to all Patreon supporters who have supported Religion for Breakfast, past, present, and future, thank you so much. You make this channel possible. Let's hear it for eight more years.